Okay. Um, could I just have your attention, please, everybody? Sorry about that, uh, the confusion, but I think we will start because uh, it's going to be, we've got a lot to get through this evening. Uh, so just start again. I'm Simon Lister. I'm Vice Chair of the World Land Trust, and it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome you here this evening. It's fantastic to see the, the room so full, and I hope it's going to be a very interesting and enjoyable evening. Um, just before we start, I just wanted to say a very quick word about the World Land Trust and why we put this event together. Um, the World Land Trust, as many of you will know, was set up uh, nearly 25 years ago. In fact, 20, next year is our 25th anniversary. Uh, with the mission um, of securing land that's a threatened habitat um, for conservation in different parts of the world. Um, two things that uh, I think is important to know about it is one is that we never buy land ourselves. We always work through our local uh, NGO conservation partners. And we think it's more, you know, we don't think it's right that a British organisation should be buying up different parts of the world, but we do think it's very important that our local partners, uh, one, they've identified a conservation priority. If we can help them secure land that's important for conservation, we think that's an appropriate thing to do. And of course, we have to be very strategic because with our limited resources, uh, we have to make sure that the land we buy is, 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 is gonna be, have a sort of as much impact as it can. So often we'll be supporting our local partners uh, secure corridors, for example, where it's bits of land that are gonna link up other parts of protected areas so that by securing that bit of land it actually secures a much bigger uh, uh, area of land. And we've had lots of successes um, and there's something actually I'm going to tell you a little bit about at the end just to mention now briefly called the Big Match Fortnight which is a fantastic, uh, not a football match, it might sound like it, but it's actually a, a fortnight of fundraising for, for Borneo which, is, which I'm going to say something right about at the end because I could do with a bit of help from you. But I've, enough for that now. But this evening is not necessarily talking about some of the successes of, of World Land Trust. What we found and what our partners find is that there are many, you know, conservation is a tough business. There are many challenges, there are many real problems out there, as we all know. And many of those difficult issues often don't get the airtime that we think that they should. And often they're swept under the carpet, just not talked about because they're too difficult. And what you're going to hear tonight does not mean that World Land Trust uh, endorses those views or agrees with those views. But what we do think is it's very important that those difficult, sometimes controversial issues are aired and, and discussed and debated. And that's what the purpose of tonight's all about. And I'd like to start by thanking the Sibthorpe Trust, who kindly sponsored us uh, uh, with this event, and thank them for, for their support. Um, how it's going to work is that we, and I'll introduce the speakers and the people on the panel in a minute, is we're going to have uh, two speakers, and then there's going to be a QA and a and a discussion section, and then there's going to be a break, um, and, uh, and then we're going to have the final three speakers and a Q&A uh, a session, and then we'll wrap up at, at the end of it. Um, now, the speakers that, that we've got, and the first speaker is going to be Chris Packham, who many of you will know, um, obviously a very well-known uh, broadcaster uh, in this country, but also an eminent zoologist in his own right. But of all the things he does, by way the most important is the fact that he's a patron of World Land Trust. <laughs> um, and next to him is Vivek Menon. Um, and Vivek is from India. He's the chief executive of the Wildlife Trust of India. He's one of the leading conservationists in India. Um, and Wildlife Trust of India is the World Land Trust partner in India, so we do a lot of work um, um, with uh, Vivek. Um, and um, it's a huge pleasure that, to have him over because he's made this, this trip specially because he and we felt it was important to hear uh, what he had to say. And um, Vivek, as I, you know, I've known him for many years, is no shrinking violet, so I'm much looking forward to what he's got to say. Um, and next to Vivek is Mark Avery, um, and just as Vivek is one of the leading conservationists uh, in India, uh, Mark um, is one of the leading conservationists here in the UK. Uh, for many years, Mark was head of conservation at the RSPB. Um, he's now a freelance, a freelance conservationist, writer, serial blogger, 
Um, I think Remark must be the most prolific uh, conservation blogger, well, he's certainly one of them in this country, if not the entire planet. Um, and it's also a great pleasure, Mark, to, to have you here. And next to Mark um, is, jo is George, and I was asking him earlier, does he like to be called George Fenwick or George Fenwick? Because he's actually from the US. And he was saying, well, when I'm in America, I call myself George Fenwick. When I'm here, I call myself George Fenwick. Um, <laughs> But I'm told that in his, in, his, in, in his office he's known as the High Commander and the Emperor and various, and various, and various other flamethrower things that I didn't quite understand. But George is President and CEO of the American Bird Conservancy um, and the American Bird Conservancy has, has worked with World Land Trust to undertake a number of projects in, in Latin America. And I think it's probably also fair to say that uh, George is not particularly fond of cats. Um, and next to George um, is Celia, Celia Haddon. And Celia is a, a journalist and, and an author, has written many books, many of which have been about cats. And, uh, and Celia, I don't think, would uh, mind being described as somebody who is very fond of cats. Um, and um, actually, joking aside, I mean, apart from being a prolific um, author and writer, um, Celia also won the Blue Cross Award for her services to animal welfare and so has a very distinguished uh, record in that field. And again, Celia, it's, it's, it's great to have you here. So, um, a uh, terrific panel and uh, I hope you all enjoy the evening and I'll start off by giving the floor to Chris. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I'm Chris Packham, and I'm a failure. Because every morning I wake up, the first thing I think when I open my eyes is that Chris Packham Limited, established 4th of May 1961, is in the conservation business, and my business isn't going very well. So I thought I'd tell you how badly my shares are standing at the moment. Because if you've been investing in Chris Packham Limited, this is a shareholders meeting that you're going to leave with your head down and your pockets nearly empty. Sorry. In 1961, when I was born, I can't tell you how many tigers there were in the world because the census methods were inadequate and there weren't censuses uh, uh, initiated. We were still trophy hunting tigers until 1970 and so on that account, censusing them to count them was not particularly important. The closest figure that I could come up with for the time of my birth, that point of reference, if you like, which we all use, it's a fallacious one, but we, we use it, uh, was in the region of in excess of 40,000 tigers. At some point during the uh, intervening 52 years, there's been at least a 70% decline over 30 years. That was when they started to census it. And in terms of the population now, we're looking at between 1,500 and 3,000 so let's say around 2,000 tigers. We've lost the uh, Caspian tiger, and we've lost the Javan tiger too in my lifetime. And there are now less than 300 Siberian tigers. After a modest increase during my lifetime, the poaching has increased there. In fact, the rate of poaching for tigers is now higher than it's ever been since I've been alive. That's tigers. That's the world's largest cat undeniably one of the sexiest species that we have on the planet and therefore one of those that you think we might have made a good job of looking after but we haven't it's gone from in excess of 40,000 to in the region of 2,000 in my lifetime significant loss of stock sorry shareholders what about black rhinos then black rhinos well, they were censused. I guess they were a bit bigger, they were equally shy, and they disappear into bushes, I uh, seem to experience. But nevertheless, people did go out and census those. The best effective census that I could find was actually not in 61, but in 1970. And then we thought that they were in the region of 70,000 black rhinos in the world. So one can only imagine that in 61, that number would have been quite significantly in excess of that. What about now? Well, now they are well known because the management of black rhinos is intense and as a consequence they are regularly counted. They're counted down to the individual animal. And we have about 5,000 and, well, I can't tell you exactly how many because since I've been talking one could have been killed. 
the last time the figures were printed, it was 5,055. We've lost the western black rhino, though, in the course of my lifetime. One rhino is poached every nine hours in South Africa, and the rate of poaching of rhinos, both black and white, has doubled in the last, each year in the last ten years. Rhinos and tigers are heading for extinction. What about pandas? I've always had a lot to say about pandas since about 1996. So let's think about the panda. I tried to find out how many pandas there were when I was born. And again, you know, China at that time, under communist rule, censusing probably improbable. A bit later on, they started looking at faeces and counting footprints, all of the rather inadequate, with the benefit of hindsight, census techniques. So I can't tell you how many pa pandas there were in 1961. The, the best estimate that I could come up with for the 1960s was 1,600 animals. But let's be fair, that could be a, 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 an, ina an inaccurate figure. How many pandas are there left today? About 1,600. So there were, in the region of perhaps 1,600, and there are now 1,600. Well, that was 2004. So they've held their own, and you may think that that's good news. Um, I, I don't particularly think that's good news, given all of the interest they've had, all of the effort and energy and finance that we've expended on pandas in the course of that time. We have 62 panda reserves now, although 50% of their habitat has dwindled to nothing during the course of my 52 years. Um, those reserves that we do have are not intact. The largest, perhaps, and the most important at Wo Long is now being seriously deforested because, paradoxically, it attracts a large number of tourists, which has you know, attracted a large number of local entrepreneurs to cater for those tourists, which means that the human population is burgeoned uh, around the edge of the reserve, which means that, given there's no fuel, they're cutting all the trees down. So they're destroying the resource that they're trying to protect. Well, of course, we've been doing everything we can to, um, to breed ca pandas in captivity. And I can tell you that since 1960, well, between 1960 and 2001, two, 210 pandas were born in captivity. And some of you may have seen the joyous reports on the BBC in the last month of uh, pandas that were born in Chengdu this year. Uh, I think it was 13 of them all lined up in nappies on the floor uh, in, a, in a row of uh, abominable cuteness. Um, my question to you would be, what worth have these animals? Because to date, no animals that have been born in captivity have been successfully released back into the wild. So that population of 1,600, if it persists, does so on the basis of the fact that the land has been protected. But land in China is difficult to protect because it's, there's a, a thirst for great agriculture. Most of the pri uh, panda's primary habitat, the lowland bamboo forest, has gone and the creatures have been driven uphill where the diversity of bamboo species and their palatability is considerably less. And as a consequence of that, the species, which is already not prolific at breeding in the wild anyway, is struggling to do so. But we've still got 1,600, so hats off. Hats off despite the vast expenditure. I have to tell you as well that a third of all of the species living in China are currently endangered. That's a third of everything. A third of mammal, bird, frog, reptile, amphibian, you name it. One third of all of the species in that country are endangered. So maybe in further investment in the panda might be expensive. But of course, you know, threatening uh, species with extinction is not a Chinese issue by any measure. Across the world, we've got serious issues. 41% of our, ma our, our amphibians globally are reckoned by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, prominent body in censusing and publishing on this account. 41% of amphibians in danger of extinction, 25% of mammals, and 13% of birds are in danger of extinction. So, as you can see, in the uh, lifetime of Chris Pack and Limited Conservation Services, things aren't going too well with not only the megafauna, which has attracted a huge amount of our investment and conservation endeavour, but with the rest of the species too. And there must, of course, be a reason for this. What is the reason? Well, when I was born, there were three billion people on the planet. Now, there are seven billion people on the planet. And uh, how has this been, been facilitated? Well, we've had what we might call the Green Revolution. 
because quite clearly, to expand the Earth's population in human terms like that, we've had to cater for it in terms of food. And that meant that we needed to make the uh, profoundly uh, 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 enormous differences in the way that we, we farm. And so we've come up with industrial scale farming, which means industrial scale usage of fertilizers, uh, chemicals, herbicides, pesticides. We've had to greatly expand our land use. We've had to introduce factory farming, and we've had to get into factory fishing too. And of course, the result of this is plain to see, and all of you will be aware of it. Massive habitat loss, leading to very many of these uh, endangerments with these animals, huge amounts of pollution, and in the seas, massive amounts of overfishing too. I have to tell you that um, things don't look particularly good um, for the future of Chris Packham Limited either, because by 2050, we think that the human population may expand to, expand to uh, 10 billion people. Now, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be alive in 2050. The BBC keep working me like they are at the moment. There's no danger of uh, next month. But, um, so I, I'm not banking on 2050. But um, yes, that, that's, that's not good. I can tell you already, you see, that 40% of the Earth's land surface is under agriculture. 40% is under agriculture. 86% of the UK's land surface is under agriculture or forestry. So our thirst for land in order to feed ourselves and our drive to maximise the efficiency of that food production it has already had profound effects on the Earth's flora and fauna and it will continue to have increasingly profound effects too. Demands for food, by the time we get to 2050, will be significant. So what are people doing about this? You may think that they're uh, neglecting to worry about it. Well, they're not. Of course they're not, because there are, somewhere out there, some intelligent people. And what's happening is that there is a massive land grab taking place all over the world. Land is being snapped up by uh, corporations, companies, and indeed countries. And at the moment, given the wealth and its distribution in terms of the uh, world's economy, one country that's grabbing more land, more widely than anyone else, is China. And that's uh, perhaps not a good news, because China, it seems culturally and politically, does not have the outlook that we have in terms of protecting the world's wildlife resource. Because... What they don't seem to have grasped at this point in time, or what they don't demonstrate that they have any grasp of, perhaps, is that without the world's wildlife resources, then we're doomed. And that's a very simple fact. If we unsustainably continue to absorb those resources, then ultimately the lack of what we call ecosystem services, that, that all of the life provides us with in terms of pollination, providing chemicals for medicines. I mean, the list is just boundless. And currently worth trillions and trillions of dollars a year will dry up. And our soils won't function. Our forest won't be there. And as a consequence, nor will we. There's not a racist cell in my body. There are a few things that I abhor in life, and racism is one of them. It's very difficult, therefore, to stand here and point the finger at a nation. But I can tell you that 80% of the world's wildlife crime either is trafficked through or ends up in China. I don't need to tell you about rhino horn or tiger bone or the fact that they're now farming tiger, uh, lions in South Africa because they know that the tiger bone is going to run out fairly rapidly and they need something else. At the moment, we've got a population of maybe 50, 30,000 lions. We're not entirely sure. They're quite difficult to count. Um, but already, Chinese are, 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 using, are using lion bone as a supplement to tiger so that when it runs out, they have an alternative. Last, no, three months ago, a boat was stopped off of Mauritania on the west coast of Africa. There's a story that appeared in, the, I think it was on the BBC news site, but it, it, it didn't get wide publication. A boat was stopped in these seas, a Chinese vessel, and on board were 96,000 seabirds. 96,000. A, a large number of them were gannets. So this is our side of the world 
those are birds that might have been nesting on the Bass Rock or further north in Europe. They were wintering off at the coast of Mauritania and literally being hoovered out of the sea. What are we going to do? We have tried culturally to impress our need for education and uh, change of policy upon the Chinese. Uh, I remember many programmes that have been uh, put into place to do that, but they've failed. And now we have an increasingly rich country with increasingly rich people with increasingly large demands upon those wildlife resources. And that's why those rhinos are being poached at such a rate. That's why the tiger will be extinct in my lifetime if things don't change. In the wild, of course, I'm talking about. So what do we do? Do we wait? Um, say nothing? Well, no. At the moment... I see on the news that uh, George Osborne, our Chancellor, is heading a trade delegation to China. He's seeking to instigate a further relationship with the, the country in exchange for trade going both ways and no doubt investment within the UK. We're in a financial crisis that's going on and on and of course we all want out of it. But do we really want out of it at the expense of not using that as a lobbying position to ask China to rethink its its wildlife policies, not only for the tiger, not only for the rhino, these flagship species, but also for all of the forests that it's bought in Western Canada and Northern Australia and Western Africa. I have the great good fortune to travel the world in the course of my work, and increasingly, when I get off the plane, I see bizarre symbols in, in a language I don't understand nailed onto a tree because those resources will be exhausted if we don't do something about it. Wouldn't it be good if George said to his Chinese delegates, we are very keen for you to come and build uh, an, a, an airport in Manchester, and we would like to buy more of your almost impossibly cheap goods, but only if you do something about the importation of rhino horn and tiger bone. Wouldn't it be good if we got to a point where we were electing politicians who have an understanding and a will to do something about protecting the world's biodiversity? Because frankly, it needs protecting for our good, their economic good, and the long-term good of our planet. But we're not at that point, are we? You know, we have politicians who show some understanding of the environment, and I have to say without being cynical that on occasion I get to meet politicians who have a far deeper understanding of environmental issues, climate change, so on and so forth. But none yet that understand that biodiversity counts and that without it we are doomed. None yet who understand that unless we find a way of curbing our own population growth, we are doomed. It's going to be potentially a, a long wait for that to happen, and uh, that would require a lot of faith. I think it, it, it might happen. We have an increasingly sophisticated uh, youth who are far uh, more aware of the problems than I was. Chris Packham Limited, aged 13 to whatever it was, 23, during the course of my education. Far more than many of you were, and they will come through, but they'll be coming through at a time when those pressures are significant and great. I, I, I'm not sure I want to bank on that manifestation of reality. I don't want to wait for informed politicians to correctly exercise the pressures they should be when it comes to negotiating with nations such as China. In the interim, then, we've got to do something to stop the gap. I've got to stop my shares sliding out because I'm facing bankruptcy. What can we do? Some good news, some hope. Well, in the uh, year 2000, uh, Conservation International, an American conservation charity, was in Guyana, a small country in South America, which has a large proportion of its, uh, its rainforest, its tropical forest, uh, intact. And their informed government uh, formed a relationship with them based upon the fact that they would um, support sustainable use of that environment if they received capital in income. So Conservation International went home for the weekend. Um, they rang up a few benevolent Americans who, chumped, who turned out a few million pounds, and this got the ball rolling. I can tell you now that um, the Norwegian government is giving the government of uh, uh, Guyana 250 million pounds a year, and other European governments are 
beginning to give them money too, and not only Guyana, but Suriname, their uh, country next door, um, and support this policy. And they appear currently to have a stable government which is forward thinking. Is it worth it? I mean, we're talking about one of the smaller countries in, in South America, not Brazil with the mass of Amazonia. Well, yes, 20% of the world's fresh water moves through those two countries in some form. 20%. And 18% of our tropical forest carbon is captured in those forests. 18%. That's significant. And at the moment, it's not being clear found by the Malaysians and Chinese who were sniffing around to do that. So this policy has acted as a temporary, I should only imagine, a temporary means of protecting this wider environment. Not dependent on the mega species, uh, the megafauna, the charismatic, glamorous, sexy species. Not, you know, selling cuteness to raise money to keep the number of pandas the same, but looking after the wider environment, indeed a whole ecosystems. And the World Land Trust are doing the same thing. At the moment, on a more modest scale, but if there's anyone out here with $250 million today, then please put your hand up, we'll speak to you afterwards, that would be super. In 1989, they were founded with Buy an Acre, um, and at the moment, they oversee the management of 4 million acres worldwide. And it's not about those sexy species. It's about acquiring land to protect it and intelligently seeking to acquire land to join parcels that were already there. You heard uh, Simon talking about corridors. These are essential things. And also, their remit is such that they... Um, employ those local partners, which is implicitly important, and they've been able to influence governments through the work of uh, Vivek, our next speaker. They've had influence within the Indian government. So here seems to be a, a model for the immediate future. Okay, I've spoken about Guyana. The World Land Trust owns land in, in, in many, or their partners own the land uh, 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 in, in many other parts of the world. You can read if, and find out more about that if you're not a member. Uh, what about the UK? Well, the UK has indeed um, raised the issue of landscape scale conservation. Both the wildlife trusts and the RSPB have their schemes. And of course, in terms of conservation technique, they are far more intelligent than either single species conservation, i.e. save the dormouse, the otter, whatever it happens to be, um, or just collecting little postcards of the past, as I call nature reserves, scattered haywire over the country. Um, and clearly there are, um, and have been for some time, uh, desires to choose the land that we buy, purchase, or achieve management of in a far more selective way so that we can think about preserving um, a, a wider environment. But the simple problem is that we can't afford it. And as much as the, you know, the, the Wildlife Trust bang on about living landscapes, they've got no two red cents to rub together. An acre of land in Oxfordshire is worth £40,000. We can't afford to buy that land. And at the moment, that land is under increasingly intensive agriculture. So for us to make a difference in this country, where we don't have the culture of our conservation bodies being able to nip off for the weekend and come up with, I can't remember what they call it, $30 million, because we don't, we don't as a culture do that, there won't unfortunately be the pack and wing of Southampton General Hospital if I had millions, I probably would give it, but we, I, I don't. We, we don't think in that way in, in, in our world. So what are we going to do about it? Our only hope, again, is to lobby our politicians to go to Europe and seek serious reform of the common agricultural policy, which has, for a long time, had a profound negative impact on our working landscape which, again, is a tall ask. In 1997, the Labour government were elected on the, uh, you know, the manifesto promise of doing that. And I think there was one meeting in France, a few French people set fire to some living sheep under the Eiffel Tower, and um, the, it, it disappeared off the agenda. Since then, nothing much has happened. And we still spend millions of pounds a year on subsidies, subsidising schemes which are either not well thought through in terms of wildlife and don't work particularly well, or... Uh, subsidising essentially um, ineffective and, and uh, um, unoptimal methods of, of, of food production. Single farm payment, honestly, what on earth is going on? So, what are we going to do about that? Well, I suppose it has to come down to us again, us as individuals, doesn't it? 
And at the moment, we're in the midst of a, a badger cull. And I've been outspoken on that account, uh, opposing the cull, obviously, on scientific grounds. I was brought up as a scientist. I like badgers, yes. I don't love them. I love my poodles, but I don't know badgers enough as individuals to love them. But don't get me wrong, I have a full appreciation of both them as an individual species and for the role that they play in our ecosystems. But my pragmatic outlook has been governed by the science. And the science has, and I won't dwell on this because you'll be familiar with most of it, um, has dictated that in all but a few situations, culling badgers is not the answer to the BTB problem. That's what's led to my and many other thinking conservationists' uh, opposition to, to this practice. But at the same time, I manifest a real sympathy for, for the farmers. I've visited farms, one for the last 10 years, where there have been numerous outbreaks of TB and the herd has been repeatedly slaughtered. And I've seen the distress and the financial hardship that this has wrought upon that farmer. So what can we do as individuals? What can me and you do tomorrow to influence our immediate landscape? I mean, if it comes to putting a pound in a pot, I'd say put it in the pot for the World Land Trust rather than the pot for the panda. But what at, ho what at, what at home? What can we do there? Well, I think the best thing that we could do is show greater support for the UK's farmers. At the moment... Many of them are struggling to survive under a supermarket, a supermarket monopoly which fixes prices, imports food from other parts of the world to sell at a loss to get you and me through the door so that they can make profit on a few other things. And this does nothing to, to help them at all. If we were to put a few more of our pounds into the pockets of the UK's farmers, perhaps we British conservation conservationists would be allowed the temerity to knock on the farmhouse door and say, hold on. Please don't do that to your hedgerow. Please don't fill your pond in how about digging a new one and think twice about badgers. But when an industry's under the cosh and it's, get, it's had precious little government support, um, it's been governed by a policy set in Europe by the French and Germans before we were even involved, and they've had to live through all of this, and then they've got a vast public who's only interested in cheap food and scoring it as quickly as possible in the local supermarket, is any wonder they don't listen when we say to them, hey, lay off the badgers. Not really. Humans will decide the fate of this world. There's no doubt about that. And our farmers are currently going to decide the fate of the UK landscape. We need to help those people. We need to liaise with them. We don't need separating mechanisms like this car. We need to put this behind us when the fiasco ends and then move forward. So if I can leave you with one last message, please join the Wildlife Trust, who have been unnaturally silent, the RSPB, who have been unnaturally silent about the badger cull because of their affiliations with large landowners, okay? and put your pound in the pot of your local farm. I don't see that as controversial. In fact, I don't see any of the stuff that I've said so far as controversial. I think that we are in for a very uncontroversial evening. <laughs> because I, I have a good idea about what my fellow speakers are going to say. And I think we're going to hear a lot more common sense. And that, I suppose, will disapp uh, disappoint some of you. So, as a parting shot, I'm going to give you just a little bit of controversy. And a striptease is always good for that. <laughs> And a number of people have commented that I looked far too smart this evening, <laughs> as I don't normally appear in a Prada shirt and suit. So I think it's probably more appropriate that I get rid of it, if I can undo it, and show my true colours <laughs> by displaying a T-shirt with a badger and a machine gun. Thank you very much. <laughs>
controversial or non-controversial fellow panelists and uh, paying members of the British public. It gives me no great pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Number one, it's too much of a cliche to say it gives me great pleasure. Secondly, it does not give me any pleasure at all to fly eight and a half hours one way, give a talk, and then go back eight and a half hours one way, <laughs> even if it's a Royal Society. <coughs> Especially since uh, last week I was at another Royal Society, a Salamanca in Spain, talking to them about tigers. And that was in a, in a room where I, I was told that Christopher Columbus told the Queen that he had found India, the worst geography department in the world. <laughs> so after that, coming and speaking at the Royal Society in England, well, and I was told to speak initially on badgers. <laughs> I've seen a badger only once. <laughs> After the World Land Trust uh, chairperson, Rohini, very kindly gave us tickets to Wimbledon. I was given lots of pim to drink. I drank a lot of pims. And another trustee, Simon Barnes, took me with John Burton and showed me two or three badgers. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful animals, but I don't know anything about that. But I thought, when I, when I heard about the cull and I tweeted, that was a mistake, tweeting. That gets around the world. It gets you called uh, to the Royal Society. I thought, as Emil Zola said, that the fate of animals is of far greater importance to him and to me than the fear of appearing ridiculous. So here I am to talk to you a little bit, well, not about badgers, but about carnivores. But I bring badgers into the conversation. That was a brilliant speech. I can only fault you on one thing. You said tiger, R.I.P. No way. Okay? I know nothing about badgers. I know my tiger. And we're not going to let that happen in our lifetime anyway. But the second thing is I'm very glad you said you're not a racist and you don't want to point fingers at China. So I hope some of you will be sympathetic if I point a finger at Britain once in a while. I'm not a racist either. <laughs> I, I will look a, a little bit at these texts uh, because I would read a bit of scriptures and scripts that were written. The reason I, I, I started thinking about this when I, when, I, when, when I heard about the Badger Cull was just outside my house, or very close to it, are the oldest laws on animal protection in the world. Before I came up here, I looked up the website of the RSPCA, which says it's some law that Britain passed in 1800. That's the oldest animal protection legislation. Well, come to my house. I will take you to an iron pillar erected 2,300 years ago, 3rd century BC, by Ashoka the Great, which talks about animal protection. And the penalties that you would pay if you did not protect the animals that he told you to protect. I would like to think that those are among the first animal protection legislation in the world. And they're written, and down there in a script that you and I do not understand. But today we know enough to decipher. And let me read some part of it. <clears throat> if, if people don't know Ashoka, you know, he, he was uh, one of the largest emperors of India, killed a large number of people before he turned pacifist, after seeing the, <laughs> the horrors of war, became a Buddhist, and then preached pacifism. And in this edict, he says, I have enforced the law against killing certain animals. The greatest progress of righteousness among men, I suppose also women, comes from the exhortation in favor of non-injury to life and abstention from killing living beings. Beloved of the gods, I, King Piyadasi, which is what his original name was, Ashoka just means the great, speaks thus, 26 years after my coronation, various animals were declared to be protected. Parrots, miners, the bird people would like this, <laughs> ruddy geese, sorry, <laughs> wild ducks, bats, queen ants, Terrapins, boneless fish, tortoises, porcupines, squirrels, deer, wild asses, wild pigeons. In fact, any four-footed or two-footed creature that are neither useful nor edible. Even among them, he says, those goats, ewes, and sow which are with their young or giving milk to their young are to be protected. And so are young ones less than six months old. Cocks are not to be caponized. Husks hiding living beings are not to be burnt, and forests are not to be burnt either without any reason or to kill any living creature. That's 2,300 years ago. RSPCA, if in the audience, may please note. Unfortunately, they didn't say badger. But that possibly was because India as a country does not have badgers. 
not true badges and we have honey badges, we have hog badges, but they're not really badges and not, not your black and white stuff that are cute. But let me tell you one thing, we do have TB. And I think it's a key thought that people in this room should take back with them. We have no badges, but boy, we have TB. Millions of Indians have TB. I'm sure millions of cattle have TB. We don't even have the time to look at the cattle. We're looking at the human beings, right? And we have TB. But we're not thought of killing our wildlife in order to control TB. In any case, if badges are culled, you'll find something else. The vector will find something else. The bacillus will find another vector. And what do you do then? Cull that to exterminate another species? And how far will this go? I'm not sure. I mean, this sounds to me like <clears throat> the British government is, is saying the animals of the world exist for our reasons. Yeah? And somebody, if I remember right, is Alice Walker, who said that animals exist for their own reason, not for our reason. They were not made for us any more than black people were made for white or women were made for men. I think it's time we start thinking as to why these animals exist and whether we, when we have a certain problem, it's undeniable, I'm sure, as Chris said, that there is a problem that we take on an entire species and try to exterminate, even if it's from parts of it. <clears throat> Let's not dwell on, on, on Ashoka or another person, an advisor of his grandfather, Cotillia, a Machiavellian advisor. I'll come to him later. But let's just consider what we're killing off. I mean, I, I, I was told that the badger is the largest carnivore uh, or largest terrestrial carnivore. Let us take the gray seal and the fox along with it uh, in Britain. So this would be, in my parlance, like my killing the black bear, the brown bear, and the tiger altogether, just because there was a problem. But do we have a problem? Yes, we do. The black and brown bears together kill and eat 100 people a year. You add the tiger, that's 200. You add the elephant, that's 600 a year. 600 Indians are killed or eaten. We are not talking about cows dying of some disease. Right? We call the elephant God. We venerate it. We have put aside 14% of India. 600 national park sanctuaries for these animals. We have a law that authorizes us to kill that animal if it's a threat to human life. After five people die, my government debates whether to catch it. There's no question of killing it. Right? Nobody uses that law to kill it. It's an extraordinary country. It's an extraordinary ethic. I do not mean to take that and place it elsewhere. It will be out of context if you use it in your country or any other country. But I just want to tell you that this is what we do to ensure that what Chris Packham said does not come true. If you say Tiger R.I.P., for us to make sure it's not Tiger R.I.P., we lose 100 Indians a year. And we do not talk about exterminating that man-eater. I employ 250 people in the field, and they do a, a number of things. And one of the things they do are, are veterinary stuff. I remember last year, when there was a man-eating incident, I sent a team of six boys to the ground to try and find out what happened. While they were there, the tiger ate a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth person, killed and ate. Because I'd sent a team of biologists and veterinarians, they came back with camera trap photos of the tiger on the kill of a human being. I spent a whole sleepless night looking at the camera trap photos, comparing the stripes and saying, yeah, this is the same animal. It is the same animal, all six kills. I took it to the head of, director of National Tiger Conservation Authority, and he said, Vivek, please do not give me these pictures. He said, if you give me, I will have to declare it a man-eater. So I really don't want to do it. Tell your vets to capture it. Let's just put it away somewhere, but don't ask me to kill it. After I've got camera trap pictures of it eating six people. It's an incredible country. And that is why I disagree with him when he says tigers will go extinct. They may go extinct everywhere else, but in our home, we preserve them and we keep them. Despite the fact <clears throat> that I have one third of the world's poor in my country. So we are not talking about poor English farmers here. We're talking about people who eat mud or feed their children mud so that they don't hear them cry before they die. We have got one third of the world's poor. It's a crushing reality. No conservation can be done in India without keeping that in mind. I was in New York with my prime minister at the UN a week ago, and he was talking about 9% economic growth. 
I don't know what Britain is doing. Yeah. Let, okay, let's not, let's, let's, let's get into it. We'll tell you some good stories. But anyway, nine percent economic growth is what we want. We're going at six, we want nine. So that's the aspirational reality of India as an emerging economy. All right? This crushing reality of poverty, this aspirational <clears throat> thrust of our economy, and the ethics that our grandmother has taught us. Are all our laws are not based on science. It's based on what I just read out of Ashoka. Just last week, I advised my minister, and she has banned dolphins in any captivity in India. Completely banned, right? But that ban has come about. There was a number of controversies in terms of whether it should be kept or not kept. And I went to her. She said, you know, Vivek, please tell me. What's the science? What, what, what does it say? And I told the minister, I said, don't bother about the science. These are sentient beings. She said, sentient? That's a great word. In India, that was said. I said, no problem. I just ban it. Just based on the fact that they're sentient. Okay? So we put aside what I would consider the natural heritage of India, but also for the world. Because we try to balance. I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that there are very, very real conservation challenges happening in India. We talked about land that we're putting aside. Some of our land costs as much as your land. But you're putting it aside for elephant corridors. You're acquiring it with the World Land Trust's help, with IFOR's help, who I'm an advisor to, by the way. We talked about the World Land Trust of India. I'm an advisor also to the International Fund for Animal Welfare. My fellow panelists said only bigamists have two cards, but I'm not a bigamist, but I do have two cards and two hearts. Uh, anyway, now, <coughs> let's, 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 I mean, this is India, and maybe India doesn't apply to the world. Although, in Spain, when I was giving my lecture, my fellow uh, panelist, he was an American, uh, talking about the Anthropocene and the fact that, you know, the human beings have changed the world, he said that the number of humans to actually change ecologically or geological processes of the world is between 1 to 2 billion. That gave me hope. I have 1.2 billion right in my country. <laughs> I can almost change the world then if I can deal with my own folk. It need not be applicable here. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you remember a, a Canadian novelist called Polly Moore. And he wrote Never Cry Wolf. And I, when I was growing up, I read him. And, and he was quoting him. He says, we have doomed the wolf, not for what it is, but for what we deliberately and mistakenly perceive it to be. The mythological epitome of a savage, ruthless killer, which is in reality no more than a reflected image of ourselves. OK, another carnivore, another continent. Why am I saying that? Because on the way over, I was reading The Economist. I tend to read strange mix of magazines. And The Economist this time quotes a, a, a science, a paper, a scientific paper in Nature, which was published actually in 2008, which says that disease emergence is largely a product of anthropogenic and demographic changes and is a hidden cost of economic development, our development. So is it only the bad news? You need to think, why disease spread? It's not only the vector that that you see, but what, why is this disease spreading? In many cases, you have to think back to yourself. Apart from the fact that, <clears throat> I don't need to tell you, that this <coughs> is part of the constant of, of, of the wildness of Britain, which you were lamenting, and I've heard many people lamenting, is going. This is one of the, la <coughs> not the last, but one of the few wild things you have. You know? With 1.2 billion people, I have 60% of the world's tigers. When I say I, I mean India. I have 60% of the world's tigers. 65% of the Asian elephant. 85% of the Asian rhino. 100% of the lion in Asia. So we have still a plenty of animals. Although people do not think of India as a wildlife destination. I'm sure you think of Africa when you think wildlife. You think of the Amazon when you think forests. But India has a hell of a lot. We are not only Taj Mahal and people. Right? Whereas you have relatively less. How many birds, Mark? 400 out species? I have more in my tongue, I'll tell you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's something to think about, that when you have so little, you need to preserve it. Now, Thoreau, who you may also have heard of, it was an American writer. The British may not like him because he once very famously said that the coldest winter he has been in is a British summer. <laughs> but uh, on, on, on this topic, he writes about North America, not about Britain, but he says, in his journal in the mid, uh, middle of the 19th century, he says, when I consider that the nobler animal has been exterminated here, the cougar, the panther, the lynx, the wolverine, the wolf, the bear, the moose, the deer, and the beaver, and so forth, I cannot but feel as if I have lived 
in a tamed and, as it were, an emasculated country. Is it not a maimed and imperfect nature I am conversing with? As if I were to study a tribe of Indians, and those Indians that Columbus discovered, not us, that had lost all its warriors. He says, <clears throat> I think I have here the entire poem, and then to my chagrin, I hear that it is but an imperfect copy that I possess and have read, and that my ancestors have torn out many of the first leaves and grandest passages and mutilated it in many places. I should not like to think that some demigod has come before me and picked out some of the best of my stars. I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. An entire heaven and an entire earth. <clears throat> I suppose Badger should be part of that. It's part of essentially a noble nation. So I return back to my last part, again back to India, back to my ancestors. Not Ashoka, but his grandfather Chandragupta Maurya. So another 200 years back had a Machiavellian uh, advisor called Chanakya or Kautilya who wrote a treatise called Arthashastra which by the way put aside the first national parks not Yellowstone is not the first national park so 2100 uh, no 2500 years ago 200 years before there are maps and I can show you the maps because he says oh king to protect your kingdom you need elephants and he says elephants do not procreate in forests like you or me they procreate in certain forests and he describes a forest then he says, in your empire, these are the characteristics of forests, and these may be called Gajavanas, elephant forests, and these may be protected, and he actually draws the maps. So those were among the first protected areas of the world. I still don't say the first, because maybe the Chinese or the Egyptian or somebody else had, but definitely not America. <laughs> uh, so he talks about a nation. Arthashastra has nothing to do with nature. It's, it's the advice to a king of what makes a nation. And he says a nation, and I'm quoting partially, is possessed of strong positions in the center of its frontiers, capable of sustaining itself and others in times of distress. It should be easy to protect, provide excellent means of livelihood, be endowed with agricultural land, material forests, elephant forests, and should be beneficial to men rich in animals and not depending on rain for water. Okay. So while he talked about Protecting a nation, while he talked about the human needs, he didn't forget the elephants and the animals. It must be rich in wildlife to be called a noble nation. 2,000 years later, another great Indian, Mahatma Gandhi, who you may have heard of, said that the greatness of a nation and its moral character can be judged by the way its animals are treated. So I'm not being racist, and I'm not pointing a finger. But I think you in Britain today have a choice or whether to exert that moral rightness or not. Apart from the science, and I, I, it's not, I'm, I'm also trained as a scientist and I have plenty of scientific thoughts in my head. I'm not giving you any science because I do not know but better. If this is elephants or tigers, I'd give you science. Right? But there's enough ethical ground here to say that you do not cull an entire species out of an area. If you choose to follow that, I suppose some people in my part of the world would think of you as a great nation. If you don't, Mahatma Gandhi was also, you know, he was quite a humorous chap. He was not only a, a great man, but he was also a wit. So he was also asked once about his views on Western civilization. And if you don't follow it, his reply would suit. He said it would be a good idea. Discussions today, and it's now um, going to go over to the audience for some questions. Before we start, I thought I'd just start off with one with Chris, who actually said at one point that um, humans will decide the, the future. And what happens if you throw into what's happening here major national uh, natural disasters of the order of Krakatoa? Well, yeah, Krakatoa and the Deccan Flats or Shitshalu meteorite would put an end to all of that, wouldn't they, really? Um, I think more likely, of course, if you get to large numbers of organisms living closely together, we become a very important resource for other organisms. And in a world which is moving very rapidly towards an, uh, an antibiotic-free future, if I were to point a, um, you know, 
the fall of the sword of Damocles on the human race, it would be through uh, a virus living inside a bacteria that was antibody, uh, antibiotic resistant. That, that would seem like a prophecy of doom. Um, I, I don't fear for the, for, the, for the future of the human race per se. We are such uh, a resourceful and intelligent organism that I don't think we'll become extinct. But what does it say about our intelligence and resourcefulness if we have to go through a catastrophe and, and come out the other side when we have all of the means and abilities um, and knowledge to prevent that? I mean, when we speak about conservation, and, and again, let's you know, use the old shifting baseline syndrome of our lives, um, I've lived through an age where our awareness and abilities to conserve, let's just say, UK wildlife have increased profoundly. We know enough about the behaviour and ecology of so many creatures now that we can not only rebuild habitats from sterile agricultural fields to support some of the nation's most specialist species, and an example might be uh, Lake and Heath Fen, an RSPB reserve, which was a carrot field X years ago, and now supports breeding cranes, bittern and marsh harrier, I presume, and bearded tit. Um, but also, we know enough about species to be able to reintroduce them. I don't think that we lack the arsenal of abilities, technologies and techniques. I simply think that we lack the impetus, energy and political awareness to put them into practice. That's what generates my frustration. And I equally don't fear for the, you know, the end of the human race. I think we will persist, but there's undeniably the, the fact that we will persist in a very different way than, than we are practising at the moment. That can't continue like we're practising at the moment. It's that simple. Right. Well, I'm going to take questions from the floor. And um, I should remind you, the, these proceedings are being recorded. Um, they will be written up. So if you're, when you're asking a question, um, please use the microphone and please uh, give your name and any affiliation you want recorded. Um, we're all speaking very much on personal views. And I think... Fair enough to say none of us are going to represent our organisational views 100%. We want to feel free to express real views and not just represent our own institutions. Inevitably, we will, to a certain extent, represent because that's why we work for organisations. But this is meant to be an open discussion. So I'll take some questions from the floor, if I can. One down the front here. Can you wait for the microphone? Hi, my name's Louise Gray. I'm a freelance journalist. I'd like to ask uh, Chris um, about cats. It uh, hasn't come up yet, but I was interested to uh, if he if he thinks you know that that if that's having an effect on garden birds in Britain. Well, I, to be honest with you, I'd, I'd like to answer that question, but it might be impertinent given that George yeah. is going to speak about it, and he may draw upon that. I neither I couldn't steal his thunder, I'm sure. Um, but I don't want to no. waste time. I think best I, to wait till all I can say is that I, you know I have been in the past labelled as anti-cat. That's not the case at all. Um, I have no particular individual dislike for any living animal other than our own species. And uh, <laughs> and, and on that account, what I would like to see is in this country where uh, it's uh, there's a situation. I would like to see cat owners behaving more responsibly. I'm a dog owner, and I've radically changed the way that I keep my dogs. Uh, well, not you know I was keeping them when I was a kid. Um, but when you think about it, we uh, used to allow them to run out and poo all over the streets, and my dogs don't run off the lead ever, and I poop and scoop responsibly like uh, very many other people. So in a, in, in, a, in a generation, there's been a cultural change in the way that we keep dogs. I, as a conservationist here, would like to see similar changes from the people who keep cats. But let me leave it to, to George, who's going to say a lot more about it. Yes, if we could... One on the back there, Mary... Hi, I am uh, Jamie Wyver, and I'm an MSc conservation science student. I'm just wondering, in our country, if you were to pick up um, a range of today's newspapers and look at the headlines, you'll be looking at uh, whether a pop star's been twerking, or who's married to, or what, what scandal has recently happened in the world of celebrity. Conservation news does not seem to be dominating the headlines or even reaching the front pages. How can we deal with that in the UK? Um. I'll answer briefly and I'll pass on to, to, to Vivek to get the, uh, an Asian perspective on that. Um, obviously, we live in an age where we have a preoccupation, an, an, an unhealthy preoccupation with celebrity of all kind. Um, how many Tranmere Rover fans here? How many Manchester United fans? Be honest, we won't laugh. You liars. Um, <laughs> um, unfortunately, that is a, a sad artefact of our age, and I think it's a byproduct of some of the. Uh, 
some of, some of all, all of the ills that we manifest. I, I guess we just have to compete, and in a way we do. If I do speak to people about British wildlife, the thing that they manifest most concern and knowledge about are the otters and the dormice and all of these, you know, you know, our celebrities. If we think more widely, then it is the panda, the rhino, the tiger, and, all, and the elephant and all of these sorts of things. But, you know, there are a few of us out there who champion the underdog, and certainly in the programmes that I'm lucky enough to play a, a role in, um, I try to score films about flies and spiders and everything else. For me, I think, I think, I suppose, here we are, here's a simple explanation. I think that we've taught people that the greatest beauty in nature it can be manifest in an individual species, and that is not true. The greatest beauty in nature is the way that all of those species interact together to produce a dynamic but harmonious whole ecosystem. And that, when you can perceive it, will provide any naturalist with a real epiphany. So, you know, that sparrowhawk sat on the sat on your greenfinch, as I think I alluded to recently, um, you know, is part and parcel of the process. They're both beautiful birds, but what they're doing is even more fantastic. But uh, Vivek, what, what's the um, attitude in, in Asia, particularly in India? Does wildlife make the news? It doesn't make the front page. In fact, uh, I saw wildlife on the front page here today. Uh, fox hunting ban to be reconsidered. It's a telegraph. Or, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> part of controversial conservation. Anyway. But, but uh, no, no, but it's, I don't think there's an English issue. Yeah? Uh, I, I think it's worldwide. Um, in India, there's a lot of coverage. There's a lot of coverage, but it's always in the middle or towards the end of the paper. It never makes the front page. Um, I was uh, last week in New York with, uh, at the Clinton Global Initiative. There was about uh, 200 big names that you would know in, in a room, Bono and Bill Clinton and Bill Gates. Never made the news when, when 360 million were, uh -huh. were, were promised. It was on the third page or the fourth page, right? It didn't make the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post. So I think this is, this is broadly it. We have to realize it, that we're not mainstream, we're niche. Mark, would you like to comment on it? Because you've been uh, working on this area for a long, long time. Yeah, I had much success, obviously. Um, when I did work for the RSPB, we used to be very proud of the fact that we had over a million members in, in the UK, which is quite a lot. Um, I tend to go around thinking now that that means that there are 59 million people who aren't members of the RSPB in the UK, which explains why, or, or members of the Wildlife Trust or anything else, which explains why um, the papers aren't full of news about wildlife. Wildlife uh, fills up the gaps in between uh, the economy, politics and sport. Uh, when you've got a few column inches to fill, nice photograph and an, a nice wildlife story. And it's because we haven't really, and that's all of us, that's each of you sitting out there, although I don't know you all individually, and me, uh, we haven't agitated enough. How many of you have written to your MP about wildlife issue this year? I have. Well, quite a few, but you are quite a selected audience. Um, <laughs> still only, I'd say, about 10%. And some of you might have been lying anyway. And some of you might have said the wrong thing. But if, if your New Year's resolution, because we're not that far from Christmas, if your New Year's resolution was that you were going to write to your MP every month between now and the general election on the 7th of May 2015. If you did that, okay, I'll do that. My MP, he's okay. I'm not sure he'll do much. Um, but I will do that. If you do that, and if you go out and tell your friends to do that, we have the beginnings of a movement. But if we don't show that we care, then it won't be reflected in the papers and it won't be reflected in politics. And politics will determine whether you have skylarks in the fields when you go out for a walk, badgers in the fields when you go out for a walk, butterflies in the fields when you go out for a walk. So you're all sitting down, but we all have to get off our bums and do something. We're not victims. This is a democracy. We can have a say. We ought to speak up more. Well, I think that's probably been tweeted already, Mark. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are some tweets going out tonight. So we'll, you're very much on the internet, and we'll see the reactions tomorrow. Um, there's a, let's move around. There's one on the front down here, Mary. I should point out, we have got a 20-minute interval um, in the bar out, and there's plenty of space to mill around. You'll have to get a chance to talk to people. 
um, we, because we will not be able to get through all the questions that are popping up. My name is Rita Fenwick. I'm with American Bird Conservancy. We're very proud to be working with World Land Trust. I have a two-part question. Uh, I very much appreciate it and in, in understand the story you told about the success in India. Can you, how did you find the people to create the solutions? I di could you speak a little bit about where, where did those people come from? Was it a lot of people or a few people? Uh, are they people that could come from this crowd or how did you find them? And talk about the solution. What did you do? instead of thinking about the problem and talking about it? That's, that's a long answer, and I'll, I'll tell you in the bar. Uh, <laughs> broad. But, but the short thing is, as I told you, the ethic is already there in the Indians. So it's one of the, one of the largest wildlife and animal movements that exist, except, as I said, many of us are caught, unfortunately, in the realities of life that does not give him or her the time express it. So the moment you do something and, and put a hand out, there are enough people who put a hand out to help you. Generally, Indians are receptive to this. So I don't think I had to struggle a lot uh, in terms of the general public. That, that's a short answer, but I can give you the long answer. How the second part, although I was hoping you would go a little further into that, is for us, for the press, how do we get the story of the solution and the alternative and the things that work out there instead of just the problem? Which is, we talk about the problem, but we don't get that other important thing and the hope part in. And I, th I think that's very important. And not, not just the solution, but also the victories and the celebrations. As a tribe, we do not celebrate enough. We do brilliant things around the world, but we moan and cry and we say everything is dying. Right? So, but there are plenty of there, are, there, there is a lot of things that are bad that's happening, but there is hope. And at least I'm an optimist, otherwise I wouldn't be in this business 30 years down the line, right? So I think those stories, the solutions, and the celebrations of those solutions must be broadcast much more effectively. How do you do it? Just just talk to people and talk to media. Mark, and you, you want to find Mark? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I agree with that, because I think we do have solutions and we ought to promote solutions. Um, but I, I honestly do think we ought to be dissatisfied and angry about what's happening. I don't think if you looked at how social change had happened over history, it was because people went, well, everybody's doing their best, really. I mean, slavery's quite bad, but there's some nice slave owners, so let's not rock the boat. No, people were angry. They thought, this is a terrible thing that's happening, and it must change. And... Um, uh, same as women getting the vote. Same as sticking kids up chimneys to clean them. There are lots of things happening in this world which are bad. And if the people who think they're bad go around saying, well, it's not that bad. And everybody's trying their best. And we've got to give them a bit more time. Nothing will change. You look at how change has happened over the years. It's through people being angry and pointing out how bad things are. And there's an awful lot that is really bad in what we're doing to the natural world. Some of it will come back and bite us on the bum because we do depend on the natural world. Uh, but I just think we're acting like a bunch of vandals running through an art gallery with uh, Stanley knives and spray paint. I don't want to live in a world which is, has lost its natural beauty. I want to live in a world where people have a better life which is a fairer world, but I don't want that to be achieved through concreting it over and turning the whole of everywhere in between uh, the places where we actually live into um, intensive agriculture and a desert. This is the most amazing place in the universe, as far as we know. It's got blue whales and it's got house sparrows. It's got amazing stuff. And we're kind of wrecking it. And we're not mainly wrecking it because we have to. We're not wrecking it actually because it will always be the best way for us to have a better life. We're wrecking it because we're thoughtless and we should know better. So let's decide what sort of planet we want to live on. I'd like to live on one where people have a better world, but there's a big place for nature. And that's what I want. I'm a little bit angry because I'm British, so I'm not very I'm a little bit angry, but that isn't what we've got. And I think we need to stand up and show our anger and say, this is not good enough. 
that's the world that I want my children to be able to live in and my grandchildren to live in, because it's going to take a while to get back to something really good. Chris, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think the other thing is that we've grown up to an age where environmental activism has largely decayed. I, mean, I know the Greenpeace uh, 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 protest has taken place, and we're now concerned about the future of those activists in, 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 in Russia. But, you know, our wildlife NGOs sell us a lot of joy you know, you can't pick up one of their magazines without a smiling dormouse or a happy otter on the cover of it. You know, they'll tell us that, you know, we've done great things for the red kite and the cell bunting and that we've hit all our biodiversity action plan targets for, for, you know, for the stone curlew. But these are intensively managed individual conservation successes. The fact is that the rest of our countryside is going to hell in a handcart. They don't like telling us that because they fear that we, they'll lose members. You know, and, and we ought to be stronger on them and say, well, frankly, you know, we have bought into you. We're part, we're shareholders. We pay our membership and we want you to stand up for what's right. And I think a lot of people get their membership. They put it in their wallet or their purse and they think, well, I've done my bit now. I've contributed. I've voted with my, you know, my 25 pounds. They'll get on with it. Well, they're not getting on with it. They're shying away from the bigger issues, trying to con us that everything's great out there. It isn't all about corn, you know, you know, corn crates being reintroduced. It's about the fact that every single habitat in the UK is suffering biodiversity loss. Most of our sites of special science interest uh, are, are in serious decay or have gone beyond the point where they should even be notified. And no one within the conservation movement is standing up and saying that. And one other particularly important point, whilst we're bashing ourselves in the teeth, is that... <laughs> When you and, and we're all guilty of this, and I'm certainly guilty of it, when, you and, when Sunday comes and we decide that we want to go out and see some wildlife, we go to a nature reserve because we no longer have an expectation of seeing wildlife around us in our homes or in the wider countryside. And we are in danger of accepting nature reserves as museums of our lives past. And that is something that we are getting used to. And apathy will breed from that and there will be no success. Um, I'm just going to make a short pause here and say, those of you, we've only got time for one more question. So those of you who've got questions, if you send them to us by email and put who you'd like to ask, answer them, we'll try and get all those. Because when we, we are going to publish a summary of um, what's gone on this evening, and I would like to include more of the audience participation. There isn't the time, simply isn't the time for it. Um, it's a bit like conservation, where time is running out. Just to point out, as Chris knows only too well, we do have to face up to these realities. There's a thousand hectares a day going in the Chaco at the moment. Everybody who knows me knows I'm very, very interested, very concerned about the Chaco, but a thousand hectares a day is a lot of land, and it's more than is going on in the Amazon. People are ignoring some of the habitats of the world. Everything focuses a little bit like Chris say on the, the Pandora, the Amazon. Everyone thinks that's the, rain, the most endangered rainforest. It isn't actually. It's one of the least endangered rainforests. The Atlantic rainforest is far more endangered. The Chaco is far more endangered. There's loads of places we're just getting ignored. Anyway, I'll take one more question, but I will take one in the middle there with a high hand. <laughs> but While you're waiting for him, I just want to say, oh, sorry, you don't sorry. have to wait for the authorities to do things. Do it yourself. Facebook it. Blog it. Website it. Sign petitions. This is a different age. You do not have to wait for the media. You are the media. Do it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and I think virtually everyone here, um, to a greater or less extent, you know, uses the social media now. These are very, very powerful instruments. I mean, Chris picks up things that we send out on ours and vice versa, and we, so we spread the word. Anyway, the question down there, please. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, James, he's had just a concerned ecologist. Um, just like to bring you a, bring you back to uh, to task, if I may, because you point out that it's an individual's responsibility. But um, over the last twenty years of being involved in business and people paying donations, I've yet to find any charity that has come before me or my fellow executives to say, "I want your attention, and this is how to engage with us." Because most of the time, uh, the engagement is um, is. Uh, robust and aggressive of you're a large corporation you need to buck up whereas the right approach is partnership and I'm being somewhat surprised at the lack of engagement frankly with any conservation group other than when we invited them in and yet 
I know that my own corporation, which features within your magazine, is probably one, is one of the most green-minded organisations, and yet we've not been approached to seek to do what we can do better. So I'm just kind of asking you to look yourselves in the mirror just for a moment of part of this controversial <coughs> conservation talk and ask, what are you doing to engage with the organisations that have the money rather than asking people to give more money and support your actions? I'm just wondering what you should be doing well, in that I, side. I'll start by saying that I've long asked that question of the, all of the NGOs that I've worked with. And I've asked them repeatedly to try and engage in, 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 uh, to forge those sorts of partnerships from the ground up um, because they would be productive. But I think really Mark, um, having had time at the RSPB, would have a far uh, greater authority to speak on that. I mean, what was the policy, Mark? Um, we didn't engage um, that dramatically with industry. You're right, because the RF and different NGOs are different, like different companies and businesses are different. Uh, WWF, I would say, in the UK, is the NGO that has engaged most and most um, constructively with business. Uh, you couldn't fault Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace in um, interacting with business, but maybe you might not find them quite as constructive. Um, it's quite difficult. I mean, the, R the RSPB, and I can't speak for the RSPB because I stopped working for them two and a half years ago, but as a life member of the RSPB, looking at the RSPB, it's quite obvious that the RSPB, uh, the model is to get public support. And the RSPB talks about its 1.1 million members, and that is what it sees as its way of gaining financial reward and political clout, because you do. After all, I've met many cabinet ministers, and it wasn't because they thought I was handsome, because they're quite bright, some of them, uh, nor was it because they thought I was intelligent. It was because I worked for the RSBB, and the RSBB had over a million supporters, which gets you into a lot of places. That is the model for the RSBB. Um, in the times when we... Uh, we did deal with industry, I would have to say it was patchy in how satisfying it was for the RSPB and pretty patchy as to how satisfying it was for industry. And it quite often depends on the individuals at the top of the organisations. Um, in NGOs, they don't change quite as often as they do in industry, and you can get quite a long way with a company with a very uh, sympathetic senior management, and then find halfway th through your three-year relationship, um, everything has changed. But different NGOs are different, I would say. I'm going to have to pause there. I would like to actually chip in at that point, but I'm going to keep the timetable. And um, the bar is open. Can you be back here at half past? 25 past. We'll start promptly. There will be more time for more questions later. And as I say, email, tweet, or do whatever you like in social media with any questions. Thank you.